So I say hello and welcome to all of you. I'm so happy to see all the attendees uh, attending today for the webinar with Dr. Nikolai Weber Albrechtsen, who will talk about hyperglucagonemia and a disrupted liver alpha cell crosstalk in fatty liver disease. My name is Jenny Presto and I'm the medical science liaison at Mercordia in Sweden, and I will be your moderator today. Dr. Weber Alderbeksen earned his MD at the University of Copenhagen in 2014, and he has since 2011 been studying glucagon and gastrointestinal hormones. He was trained and supervised by Professor Jens Jul Holst, and during his PhD, he has also worked closely with Professor Matthias Mann at Max Planck Institute on developing and applying mass spectrometry based approaches to study peptide hormones and metabolism. He has now established his own research group at Copenhagen University with a current research focus on exploring a new physiolog physiological term called glucagon resistance in mice and in humans with NAFLD. It is an honor for me and for Mercordia to give the webinar platform to you, Nikolai. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for participating. Uh, first of all, I would just like to emphasize that the data I'm presenting today is really a group effort, not only by our group, but also groups around Europe and around the globe. So thank you very much for that. So I would like to begin by, of course, stating the obvious, and that is that we have a global problem with obesity and metabolic diseases. Obesity is very close linked to fatty liver disease, which will be uh, um, one of the focus area of this talk, but also in the concept of diabetes. There's also areas that we will not cover today, but I think glucagon, which has a close relationship to this lipidemia and perhaps also to cardiovascular diseases. So most of you are familiar with proglucagon-derived peptides, probably GLP-1, which is commonly used around the globe to treat patients with type 2 diabetes, but also with severe obesity. One of my pet hormones is really glucagon, and that is what I will be addressing today. So I think we should remember uh, Professor uh, Roger Onger, who is really a pioneer in glucagon biology and who we lost this year. Uh, but of course, he has had an uh, instrumental effect on what we do today. And one of the things I highlight here is his development of glucagon antibodies. One of the things uh, Roger Onker and colleagues shown actually in 40 years ago using the rapid 30K antibodies was that patients with type 2 diabetes have increased levels of glucagon. And that is called or termed hyperglucagonemia. Later on, by this is one example by Jeremy Pettus, Pettus and colleagues that indeed uh, glucagon receptor antagonist has a pronounced effect on glycemia as shown in this randomized controlled trials. So it's likely that hyperglucagonemia directly contribute to the diabetic hyperglycemia. We have others have shown that perhaps this hyperglucagonemia may also exist independent of type 2 diabetes, but actually in the, concert, in the context of fatty liver disease as shown in this cartoon. So what is the actions of glucagon? Well, glucagon has many actions, and I think it's important to uh, separate the physiological versus the pharmacological action of glucagon, as it's important to recognize that glucagon also signals, at least at pharmacological doses, through the GLP-1 receptor. Today's talk will be about glucagon's effect on the liver. And to do that, I would like to introduce you to a physiological concept which we and other colleagues around the world have been terming the liver alpha cell axis. So the basic idea is that Different amino acids stimulate glucagon secretion from the pancreatic alpha cells, and glucagon through its cognate receptor in the hepatocyte reduces amino acid concentration in the periphery by increasing hepatic urogenesis and hepatic uptake, hepatic uptake of amino acids. 
So as we stated some years ago, the liver alpha cell axis is a feedback loop by which amino acid catabolism is partly controlled by glucagon dependent mechanism. So let's first have a look about amino acid stimulated glucagon secretion. In this study by Sasha Kelsen, she could show that amino acid dose dependently stimulate glucagon. Nothing new about this. This has been shown many times before in literature. What is more interesting, I think, is Katrina's work here using the perfused pancreas in mice, showing that it's actually not all amino acid that stimulates glucagon, but alanine may actually be the most powerful glucagon secretagogue. What about the actions of glucagon on amino acid catabolism? Let's have a look. In one of the studies we have been participating in, we used the glucagon receptor knockout mice and we profiled the plasma using mass spectrometry based approaches to look at what is the global effect of lacking a glucagon receptor. What I'm showing you here is a principal component analysis on the metabolome data from these mice. And what I'm showing you is that indeed there is a component which is capable of separating knockout mice from wild type. Nothing fancy about that. The question is really, what is the component one as shown here? And here on a classical volcano plot where you have on the x-axis fold chains and on the y-axis the p-value, we can see that each of the dot, each dots represent a metabolite and up here we have the amino acids. So the amino acids are significantly higher in the glucagon receptor knockout mice and this is what is driving the separation of the healthy animals compared to the animals lacking the glucagon receptor. Again in humans, Sasha has been able to show that glucagon lowers amino acid concentration within minutes and I think the term within minute is super important here because this highlights that glucagon may lower amino acid levels via non-transcriptional mechanism. And this is really one of the hot topic, at least in our opinion. So how does glucagon affect amino acid catabolism? We believe it to be mainly driven by changes in urogenesis. So let's have a look. Marie Winter, another fellow from the lab, used a inducible alpha cell loss model, the GCGR, DTR mice. And as you can see here, both by immunohistochemistry and extractable glucagon from the pancreas of these animals, inducing alpha cell loss by DT reduces extractable glucagon to um, the levels of the detection of the uh, immunoassay. Looking then at the endogenous glucagon contribution to urogenesis during an amino acid challenge, we could show that the uh, lack of endogenous glucagon uh, has a significant effect on substrate-induced urogenesis in mice. Importantly, when um, rescuing these animals with uh, exogenous glucagon load, we could then re-establish, or in other words, we could normalize the substrate-induced urogenesis in this model. Also, by using our glucagon receptor antagonist in mice, we could show that indeed urea levels, amino acid levels, are differentially upregulated as stated by the liver alpha cell axis hypothesis. And of course, also glucagon levels are as compensatory increase due to the elevated levels of amino acids. An important question is, is this translatable into humans? Sophie Hedersdal from Philip Knobs and Tina Wilsbøls group in Gentofte could show here that indeed a single dose of a glucagon receptor antagonist in healthy individuals and in patients with type 2 diabetes increases levels of amino acids and of particular notice, alanine. Marie again used the glucagon receptor antagonist in mice to show that the acute effect of uh, substrate-induced urogenesis is actually attenuated by prior administrating a glucagon receptor antagonist. 
Using a isolated perfused mouse liver, Marie then tried to interrogate the direct hepatic action of glucagon as shown here. Indeed, amino acid stimulates urogenesis, but using glucagon simultaneously, we have an enhancement of substrate-induced urogenesis. So the first summary is here that hyperglucagonemia may exist in individuals with fatty liver disease independent of diabetes, that several amino acids, in particular alanine, stimulates glucagon secretion, and that glucagon enhanced amino acid catabolism via substrate-dependent urogenesis in mice, and finally that either reducing or blocking the action of glucagon causes impaired urogenesis, hyperaminoacidemia, and resultingly hyperglucagonemia. And that is what we believe is driving hyperglucagonemia in patients with diabetes and fatty liver disease. A few words about NAFLD. So NAFLD is a heterogeneous disease ranging from simple steatosis to severe fibrosis. And actually it's a worldwide problem because up to 25% of the world population have NAFL. And furthermore, if you look into patients with diabetes, up to 75% of them may have NAFLD. So there is a close relations between NAFL, fatty liver disease, and type 2 diabetes. Let's explore more. So now we talked about the physiological action of the liver alpha cell axis and how a blocking glucagon's action may disrupt it. But now we put it in the context of disease in the context of fatty liver disease. So the idea is here again that amino acids stimulates glucagon, but here in the case of fatty liver disease, there is we have this hypothesis that indeed glucagon may not have the same effect on the urogenesis and hence amino acid catabolism. This causes decreased production of urea, increased levels of amino acids, and finally this is what driving the hyperglucuronemia seen in patients with NAFLD. Marie then took on the quest to explore common feature of mice with hepatic liver fat and mice lacking the glucagon receptor. We did that by RNA sequencing and bioinformatic analysis. And what I'm showing you here in this very little table is three things. First of all, that several of the genes uh, associated with urogenesis is downregulated, but also genes that is uh, re, uh, associated with amino acid uptake in the hepatocyte are also commonly downregulated in mice lacking the glucagon receptor or mice with liver fat. Importantly, our colleagues from Aarhus University were actually able to show similar patterns in patients with NAFLD. So it seems that there are some translational from mice to humans in these cases. Marie then went on to use a model of uh, mild NAFLD, the OB-OB mice. And here I'm just showing you that these animals have increased glucagon levels and increased amino acid levels as expected. Challenge them and looking into urogenesis, we can see that the substrate induced urogenesis is impaired compared to wild type mice. And also that primary hepatocyte has a different response to amino acids um, when it comes to urea production. Then what I think is one of the most exciting thing is here Marie used the isolated perfuse uh, rat uh, liver to dissect uh, if and how hepatic steatosis impaired the glucagon-induced urogenesis. So here in the first code, you see amino acids stimulated urea production. And you again here in the blue, you see that adding glucagon to the amino acid significantly increases the substrate-induced urea production. But in mice or in rats with uh, hepatic steatosis, we have a significant reduction in the glucagon-induced enhancement of urogenesis. And that is what we believe is called glucagon resistance. So it's not glucagon resistance to 
glucose is glucagon resistance to the substrate induced urogenesis. Indeed, looking into patients uh, with a uh, biopsy verified NAFL, we could show that it's not only hyperglucemia that is present, but indeed the hyperamino acidemia independent of diabetes. In patients, Marie then uh, moved on and looked into what are the amino acids that are differentially upregulated in patients with steatosis or even severe uh, NAFL D, NASH. And as you can see here, our favorite amino acid pops up again. I think it's important to emphasize that also differences in other amino acids are uh, pronounced, and uh, this is something one needs to take into account. Then uh, Jens Holst and I, and colleagues from the Steno Diabetes Center in Copenhagen, we were exploring a possibility of establishing a marker, a biomarker for glucagon resistant, and we call this the glucagon alanine index. What I'm showing you here is first a core curve for glucagon and a curve for alanine, and the red curve is those individuals of uh, totally 1,408 individuals whom we measured glucagon and alanine on, and they are put into tertile based on uh, their HOMA R levels. So that is a, a poor man's marker of liver fat, meaning that these individuals up here probably have a higher degree of liver fat compared to the other two tertiles seen here. And there are indeed a mutual association between those individuals having hepatic insulin resistance or perhaps liver fat and hyperglucagonemia and hyper uh, le uh, increased levels of alanine. So the index is simply calculated by multiplying the fasting concentration of glucagon versus the fasting concentration of alanine. So using this index, Marie could in a separate study from colleagues from Aarhus University show that indeed the glucagon alanine index is increased uh, in patients with steatosis and NASH. And furthermore, that reducing liver fat actually also normalizes the glucagon alanine index. S colleague Christina Gar and from um, uh, Munich area could recently show here, it was just published uh, last week, that there is a strong association between liver fat and stepwise increase in the glucagon alanine index in women. So that was a very nice uh, validation of our first data. Finally, it's important to recognize what is driving the differences. Is it steatosis or is it other spectrum of NAFLD? And in this study by Julia Steen Pedersen and colleagues, we could show that um, uh, patients with uh, different a degree of NAFLD have, have a similar uh, disruption of the liver alpha cell axis. This is the healthy individuals versus those with hepatic steatosis, which are significantly upregulated. But actually, there is no significant difference if you, we look into individuals with uh, mild inflammation versus those having severe fibrosis. So that is the, what this graph is telling. Finally, that bariatric surgery enables normalization of the liver alpha cell axis, as shown here, that after a one year follow up with new liver biopsy, we could show that after restoring a close to normal liver, we actually have similar uh, levels of, uh, of the marker of the glucagon alanine index in these individuals. So, the second summary. Uh, I would say that the liver alpha cell axis is a physiological feedback system in which amino acid catabolism is sensed and maintained by the glucagon producing alpha cell. And that the glucagon alanine index may reflect glucagon resistance toward amino acid catabolism. And here, I think it's really important to emphasize that we believe this is what's similar to the HOMA IR is for insulin resistance. So if glucose levels go up, insulin level goes up, 
And that would be the same argument for the glucagon alanin index or glucagon resistant. If alanin goes up, glucagon goes up in order to compensate now for the impaired substrate induced urogenesis and hence why there is an elevated uh, uh, levels of alanin. And finally, that hepatic steatosis appear in these experiments, both from our group, but also validated by other groups in Europe, that hepatic steatosis may impair the liver alpha cell axis. And this is what driving hyperglucagonemia and not altered glucose sensing per se, at least in patients with NAFLD and type 2 diabetes. And put it, putting this in the context of disease progression, we believe that starting from a normal liver with where you are normal glycemic and you are, have a normal sensitivity for insulin, but also for glucagon, progressing um, towards fatty liver causes not only insulin resistant, but also glucagon resistant. And furthermore, it's also important to emphasize that the incretin hormone here GLP-1 and GIP is also reduced in patients with obesity. And perhaps that together with the disrupted liver alpha cell axis may be an important driver towards diabetic hyperglycemia. So in other words, we believe that the liver alpha cell axis may be the molecular switch that connects NAFLD to the progression and development of diabetes. I would like to thank my mentors and colleagues around the world, in particular in, in Denmark, for all the help with these studies. In particular, my long-lasting mentor, Jens Holst, Henrik Wilstrup from Aarhus University, Philip Knob from Gentofte, and of course, the fellows who have been doing uh, the majority of the work presented tomorrow. Of course, there are a lot of other people that need to be thanked for all these uh, exciting studies. Uh, so thank you very much. I'd like to thank the funding agency. And finally, I would like to acknowledge the majority of people that has participated in these data. Thank you very much.